So hello friends, uh, welcome to Medicine Decoded. Hi, this is Dr. Shonali Chandra and uh, thanks for joining me yet again on uh, the second so session friends, for uh, medical diseases complicating uh, pregnancy here. So uh, in the last session we had taken up some of the medical diseases and uh, we discussed that we are going to continue with the rest of the conditions later. So in this session I am going to give you certain MCQs to help us uh, you know quickly revise the important uh, obstetric points pertaining to some of the medical diseases that we can commonly encounter in pregnancy also. Like for example I am going to talk about uh, pyelonephritis. It was a recent INI CET question in your examination as well. I will talk about appendicitis in brief and and uh, hepatitis as well and I will highlight the important uh, you know differential diagnosis which you need to keep in mind uh, again the differential diagnosis are going to be similar to what happens uh, outside of pregnancy but certain times we have to be aware of the preg uh, pregnancy specific uh, differential diagnosis as well so uh, I can see your responses here in the chat box and uh, I will now start with the questions. So let's have a look at the first question of the day. Now in this situation we have a 25 year old woman who presents at 28 weeks of gestation in the emergency and she has complained of uh, dull right sided flank pain for two days. She also has fever and chills. Uh, she has a temperature of um, 102 degree Fahrenheit. She's tachycardia, pulse rate is 100. BP is otherwise fine. The chest is clear. So you get a general picture that there's a patient who's complained of a pain abdomen. She also has fever and chills so far. Now there is also a history of small intramural fundal fibroid given to you. So that's extra information provided and on clinical examination the uterus is otherwise relaxed non-tense non-tender corresponding to the period of gestation that is 28 weeks fetal heart sound is normal but she has right-sided costovertebral angle tenderness there is no history of discharge from vagina or you know leaking from the vagina and her initial urine report uh, shows numerous pus cells and numerous bacteria which of the following is the most likely diagnosis so Hikam you are the first one to answer there you're saying it is uh, pyelonephritis so I agree with you there it is pyelonephritis so what I want you to understand from here is if you look at the other options a b c and e preterm chorioamnitis fibroid degeneration or a ureteral stone for that matter and even appendicitis even cholecystitis these are all uh, you know differential diagnosis of each other right so when a patient comes with the complaint of of uh, you know pain abdomen uh, and she's pregnant you have to think about pregnancy related causes of pain labor being one of them so preterm labor labor you know or uh, uh, problems like uh, placental abruption or chorioamnitis so you have to think of pregnancy related causes of abdominal pain and you have to think of surgical related uh, causes of abdominal pain which can happen in a pregnant woman also right so you will have to understand that you'll make your answer in this situation based on the site of the pain right antecedent history what are the things happening around the pain and then you have to take a special obstetric history also uh, regarding uh, whether she's perceiving fetal movements or not you have to take history about uh, pertaining to uterine contractions right intermittent increasing in intensity and uh, those sorts of so you have to take a complete history of the sort of pain that the woman is having the location the antecedent factors and important obstetrical points on ex uh, examination you're going to see so now in this question let's say for example it does not look like preterm labor because the uterus is relaxed otherwise the uterus would have contractions right uh, with chorioamnitis also the uterus should have some you know per abdominal tenderness so that goes against the diagnosis of chorioamnitis and again with fibroid degeneration it's a small intramural fundal fibroid had there been a bigger fibroid increasing in size fibroid I would have thought of fibroid degeneration and most of the times if there is a fibroid uh, with pregnancy 
most of the times it it does not lead to complication so it's not like fibroid degeneration is a very common complication so i leave it at that for now and pyelonephritis is the right diagnosis because of the site of pain look here na right sided costo vertebral angle tenderness this is because of pyelonephritis so that is the best answer to choose here now ureteral stone you could argue ke madam there could be you know uh, pain like this in ureteral stone also well in ureteral stone you know fever and chills will not be there if it's a plain stone related pain so because of fever and chills now the diagnosis goes more in favor of pyelonephritis this is based on the initial clinical symptoms and the initial set of uh, urine routine report that they have given to you so let's just highlight the important point regard obstetric points you need to keep in mind for pyelonephritis during pregnancy it's more often seen in the second trimester right and it is more often unilateral and it's more often right sided than left sided because the gravid uterus it puts pressure on the ureter on the right side and consequently there can be uh, right sided uh, hydronephrosis in pregnancy which is normal so there are certain pregnancy related changes in the urinary system which are more on the right side so pyelonephritis is also seen more often on the right side now the complications as far as a pregnant woman with pyelonephritis is concerned we are very much looking out for sepsis and the uh, the fever itself sepsis itself inflammation in the region of the abdomen itself can trigger preterm labor also so we are on the watch out for that as well next important point is how to make the diagnosis so diagnosis will be made by clinical signs and symptoms right the character of the pain the nature of the pain the initial examination findings and the urine routine and culture report will also be able to tell you the presence of pus cells the presence of bacteria and with culture we will be able to identify which bacteria are in uh, are causing the uh, infection right most commonly we identify e coli species now the management in pregnancy is because we are you know very cautious about the uh, progression to sepsis and she could go into preterm labor uh, women with pyelonephritis during pregnancy they should be admitted so once you admit them we send the basic set of investigations like you know cbc serum electrolytes serum creatinine blood culture will be required if the woman has sepsis and depending upon how uh, how sick she is how septic she is other investigations uh, will also be done very important in the management is iv crystalloids right she should be well hydrated with iv crystalloids prompt institution of broad spectrum iv antibiotics is required okay? Okay. so we can start with empirical broad antibiotic cover the point i'm trying to make here is please let us not wait for the culture sensitivity reports okay the reports the antibiotics can be changed at a later point of time also once the reports come back and with this treatment regime she should become a febrile in another 48 to 72 hours and once she becomes a febrile we can switch over to oral antibiotics and then you know complete the or uh, complete the total uh, antibiotic course of about 10 to 14 days now all the while that the patient is kept uh, admitted she is monitored for signs and symptoms of sepsis the pregnancy and the baby they are also monitored and very important is uh, input output charting you see you have to maintain the urine output at least around 50 ml per hour urine output should come should come that would mean that she is well hydrated first set of investigations you know once you started this treatment you will be able to see improvement in her clinical profile and we can uh, send the initial repeat investigations 48 hours later and then repeat it as and when required so once the patient is improving in afebrile we can pay discharge the patient home, uh you know after 24 hours of being a febrile right now the one point you want to remember over here is if there is no improvement that we see one thing that you need to remember here is if you see no improvement uh with the basic set of care that we have put in place okay the initial management no improvement with iv antibiotics empirically chosen uh within uh, you know 48 to 72 hours so of course you want to look at the culture sensitivity reports so review the culture sensitivity reports also make sure that we have giving the uh, antibiotics appropriately and also another important point uh also another important point is that you need to go for ultrasound kub 
if the patient is not remo- uh, improving so if not done earlier usually by this time when we have admitted the patient we have done an ultrasound baseline ultrasound so if at all not done earlier or if done earlier please review ultrasound kub uh, to rule out maybe any uh, bladder stones and or or you know renal abscess could be there so an ultrasound can give this uh, information if there is stones or if there is uh, abscess so that needs to be checked and in pregnancy sometimes you know the in uh, the usg report may be inconclusive most of the to- times ultrasound will be able to give the diagnosis but if ultrasound is inconclusive in these scenarios then in pregnancy ct scan is not preferred okay because there is uh, you know radiation exposure involved so if ultrasound is inconclusive uh, we are going to go for mri pelvis and that can help us find out uh, whether if it's a renal abscess or uh, you know stones that are obstructing and causing nephropathy that is uh, the reason we need to rule them out so broadly this is the management of acute pyelonephritis in pregnancy now he come you had asked me when to give prophylactic antibiotics that is what you want to know see if you're talking about prophylactic anti see this was in this question we discussed the clinical presentation in a woman with acute pyelonephritis right now you're talking to me prophylactic so prophylactic are basically in the sense that i think what you're trying to ask me here is if there is asymptomatic bacteria identified in pregnancy okay he come so if there is asymptomatic bacteria identified in pregnancy it needs to be treated because uh, in pregnancy there are you know pregnancy related dilatation in the renal system urinary stasis and there are other changes involved which makes infection uh, which makes the possibility of infection more increase risk of urinary tract infection in pregnancy and if that happens then there can be you know uh, if le- if that is left untreated then in 25% cases pyelonephritis uh, can happen ascending infection can happen so asymptomatic bacteria in pregnancy needs to be treated prophylactically with antibiotics right and any symptomatic urinary tract infection in pregnancy should definitely be treated other Otherwise, we would have increasing cases of acute pyelonephritis. So, I hope that clears your doubt here, right? Okay, hi, come. Your doubt is after an attack of acute pyelonephritis. See, after the patient has recovered from acute pyelonephritis, right? Then the urine routine and culture test of cure can be repeated after three months. If the infection remains persistent, then she can be put on prophylactic nitrofurantoin uh, for the remainder of the pregnancy so that no recurrences happen. So, if there is persistent bacteria remaining even after you have treated the acute episode, right? So. review on review we will decide whether this woman deserves a prophylactic uh, antibiotic therapy throughout the remainder of the pregnancy or not okay so that's your doubt now let's just also in brief talk about uh, nephrolithiasis or renal stones or kidney stones or ureteric stones during pregnancy right so stones are a Are are commonly you you see stones complicating the lives of reproductive age group female otherwise also right so again it becomes a common symptomatology a common accompaniment sometimes right so let's talk about stones during pregnancy renal stones nephrolithiasis uh, during pregnancy so most of the times these are calcium stones and in pregnancy it has been seen that mostly these are calcium phosphate and hydroxypatite. Uh, uh, stones right now in pregnant women uh, yes it has been said that in pregnant women they may have fewer symptoms again you see when you recall what happens during a normal pregnancy uh, is that the uh, pelvic calicial system uh, the u- there is a dilatation of the ureter and there is dilatation of the pelvis right in the pregnancy which is normally that is happening so because of the dilated tract pregnant women may have fe- fewer symptoms of a stones disease but yes they can have symptoms again that is renal colicky kind of pain or ureteric colic kind of pain the diagnosis you will make like you make diagnosis outside of pregnancy again clinical signs and symptoms you would like to perform an ultrasound kub uh, that can pick up most of the stones but if ultrasound kub is inconclusive in pregnancy if you have a strong suspicion of renal stones and the ultrasound kub has been done it is inconclusive then preferably we can go for mri uh, in pregnancy for stone disease also 
sometimes you may be in a situation where mri is not available or mri is not affordable by the patient or for whatever reasons if you're not able to do an mri and then you want to do another investigation then if there's a strong suspicion of stones during pregnancy renal stones during pregnancy choose ultrasound kub as the investigation but if ultrasound is inconclusive then the other choice uh, is uh, you know um, and plain x ray plain x ray but with you know in that situation you'll have to keep an abdominal shield right to uh, avoid radiation exposure to the baby or even a one shot pyelography so that is also uh, pyelography i mean that can also be done they are choices they can be done but again i would not prefer them because they will have some radiation exposure so isliye the important thing is to do an ultrasound kub if that's inconclusive one can preferably go for an mri a urine routine and culture is definitely required right you want to rule out infection all right even with stone disease you have to rule out infection also so keep that in mind okay now uh, yes so that can be i will take up the doubts later just uh, saw a doubt but let's let me get back to the later let's talk about the renal stones here so what is going to be the management right so maximum most of the patients with stone disease in pregnancy are actually going to be mildly symptomatic okay so conservative management should suffice conservative management would mean iv hydration would mean pain relief analgesics right so if there is a no infection uh, just plain and simple hydration and your analgesics are good enough right conservative and any infection if present with uh, you know renal stones along with that there is renal infection also then we have to add antibiotics to it also so you have to manage it like pyelonephritis you have to manage it like pyelonephritis right now when to remove stones in pregnancy you know why would i want to do any invasive procedure in pregnancy unless there is unless and until there is a dire need so the general indications for stone removal are the same as for a non pregnant patients like there is persistent obstruction in the renal tract which is causing back pressure changes in the kidneys and then leading to renal dysfunction or there is persistent pyelonephritis or intractable pain and you've tried everything or the pain the stone is causing heavy bleeding so these are the general indications for stone removal in a pregnant patient also now for that once this is the uh, diagnosis then we have to obviously refer the patient to the surgical side and we have to take the opinion of the surgeon also so invasive procedures they are going to plan from there and please remember that you know lithotripsy has fluoroscopic um, exposure so lithotripsy that uh, shock wake with lithotripsy in pregnancy is generally not uh, recommended so that is something we don't do for pregnant women now um arnold i think i don't i what you want to ask is what can be the management of recurrent uti in pregnancy recurrent uti in pregnancy uh, first of all uh, one thing that you need to also check is how is the water intake uh, of the woman right adequate water intake is not uh, that she remain dehydrated so her general habits as such you need to uh, ensure that she drinks enough water remains well hydrated right the other thing is recurrent uti in pregnancy please be cautious there could be it could be because of diabetes so please check for that uh, it could be because of um, associated vaginal infections right so check for that it could also be because of associated again renal stone disease check for that so you will have to find out why is it recurrent okay first of all if you can find an answer for that very good otherwise then the other recommendation is if it's re if it's happening again again then prophylactic nitrofurantoin with the repeated recurrences of uti for suppression of the uh, of bacterial growth then uh, prophylactic oral antibiotic regime maintained throughout pregnancy will be done if nothing can else can be found out okay now let's have a look um, let's have a look at the next question so i hope arnold that answers your question now there's a pregnant woman at 30 weeks gestation and she complains of uh, nausea vomiting anorexia and pain around the umbilicus for one day all right her vitals are stable she has a fever of 101 degree fahrenheit there is a diffuse peri umbilical tenderness the bowel sounds are normal the uterus is term size relaxed non tense non tender fetal heart rate normal so there's nothing wrong with the obstetric exam 
contamination. Her uh, total leukocyte count is 18,000. Hemoglobin is 12. Urine analysis is negative for protein, albumin and pus cells. Baseline LFTs and serum amylase is normal. So what is the most likely diagnosis? So like I told you in the first question also that when you have a pregnant woman with acute onset pain abdomen, then you on one side evaluate for pregnancy related causes of pain and on the other side evaluate for medical and surgical uh, uh, incidental causes of pain during pregnancy also. So these are all differential diagnosis of each other. If you look at option number A, B, C, D, E, all differential diagnosis of each other. So you can have the woman could be uh, having placental abruption, but the, with placental abruption, there should be some antecedent history of maybe high BP of some accident, some trauma, maybe a blunt trauma. So some antecedent history should be there and the uterus will unlikely be relaxed you know there is, there is increased uterine tone tenseness uterine tenderness so those findings and history of vaginal bleeding could be there and those symptomatology is not given so un placental abruption seems unlikely but it's a it's a differential diagnosis we need to consider pyelonephritis okay pyelonephritis can cause pain but then this his but the location of pain will be different with pyelonephritis right and with pyelonephritis there should have been at least some growth of uh, at least some pus cells identified in the initial urine analysis so this is unlikely then uh, Appendicitis. Yes, appendicitis looks like a likely diagnosis and correctly answering Rajat, Hikam and Asmita that appendicitis uh, seems to be like the best answer here. The prodromal symptoms of anorexia, nausea, vomiting, they are there in appendicitis as well. Uh, now, um, umbilical pain. You see, had this patient been in the first trimester, okay, she would have complained of uh, uh, appendicitis related pain in the right uh, eyelid fossa only right isn't it so with pain the appendicitis the, with appendicitis the pain is in the lower abdomen on either side right so she would have complained that that the site would have been that only had she been in the first trimester what happens in the second trimester and third trimester is that the uterus becomes larger in size so as the uterus becomes larger in size it grows into the abdomen then the appendix is displaced upward so the diagnosis of appendicitis can become challenging in pregnancy because it may not always be in the in the McBurney's point. The tenderness may not always be in the McBurney's point. So she can have that periumbilical pain and tenderness. And sometimes, you know, sometimes, you know, when the uh, appendix is also elevated, pushed up and also pushed uh, behind, then there can be a flank pain also. So again, we have to be very clinically very suspicious. So appendicitis looks, looks more likely here. With cholecystitis, on the other hand, there, there should be history of right upper quadrant pain or, you know, epigastric pain. There should be some past history of biliary colic. Maybe uh, she's a known case of, you know, gallstone disease or she's had a recurrent episodes of pain in the right upper quadrant or epigastric pain. So suggestive history of cholecystitis is missing from this clinical profile, right? And with cholecystitis, the LFT should be deranged, right? So normal LFTs is going against the diagnosis of cholecystitis in this situation. And then we have pancreatitis. Yes, in pregnancy, we can have cases of pancreatitis, but isolated pancreatitis is not that common. It is often accompanied because of some other background reason, like maybe some jaundice or, you know, uh, gallstone, uh, sorry, uh, your gallstones which have slipped into the common bile duct. So associated reasons of pancreatitis should definitely be found, right? Now, those associated reasons are not mentioned in the question. They seem not likely also. And the serum amylase is normal. So that also in this question is going against the diagnosis of pancreatitis as well. So by exclusion here and by analyzing the clinical profile, we at the end of it all, for now think that this is appendicitis right this is most likely diagnosis is acute appendicitis 
right now so of course i would like to go for further investigation so cbc urine analysis lft kidney function tests you know a mileage to rule out other diagnosis all those tests like you do in an acute abdomen patient in surgery in the same manner you will have to evaluate for acute abdomen in this situation also plus you will have to rule out pregnancy related causes you will have to ensure fetal well being also so all of this can be done by a simple ultrasound abdomen whole abdomen and pelvis right so at least that should be the baseline investigations and then further investigations as and what required right so let's have a look at the question now what they are framing now if i want to ask you that in the above patient you have the possible concern to rule out appendicitis it is now determined that imaging is needed to further evaluate this woman and they are asking you what is the best imaging to order see like i told you right now before coming back to the question here that i told you that a baseline ultrasound whole abdomen pelvis is a good in, it's is a must investigation to begin with it gives us very 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 basic important inf information right information about the fetus inside information about the placenta inf information about the well being of the baby and as well as we can visualize the kidneys and you know for the gall bladder area and the uh, liver area all of these can be uh, analyzed so baseline basic investigation yes Uh, our ultrasound abdomen and pelvis now in this question however they are particularly asking you best imaging to order so i don't deny that many cases of appendicitis will actually be picked up by good sonologist okay so ultrasound is fine sometimes yes the ultrasound the location the ultrasound uh, sometimes the appendix may be displaced and it may not be visible clearly on ultrasound and then the ultrasound report can become inconclusive right so the first investigation is ultrasound and if it's inconclusive yes i would like to go for an mri mri abdomen and pelvis ct scan not uh, to be uh, preferred okay mri is preferable in pregnancy we want to avoid radiation exposure so in this question they are asking with the best imaging to order just because they have mentioned the word best i would like to go for abdominal mri okay but i have told you please remember first investigation is a basic ultrasound okay it will give you a lot of information and if at all it is inconclusive and we have a strong suspicion then we can go for an mri but yes mri is better than ultrasound so that is why this is the best imaging to order fine so with this we are uh, we are done with how to investigate in this particular situation okay now let's have a look at the next question so on further evaluation probable appendicitis is diagnosed they are asking you what is the treatment okay antibiotics and observation okay cesarean section at the time of appendectomy observation alone or um, you know immediate laparotomy and appendectomy if appendicitis is found so i want to give you before you attempt this question and before you're making up your mind about what should be done i want to give you information here regarding how pregnancy related changes can affect the course of appendicitis i told you that the appendix is pushed upwards right during pregnancy because of an enlarging uterus so uh, normally usually what happens is that the uh, appendix is nicely surrounded by omentum and everything so uh, the infection uh, is con well contained it's well contained in pregnancy however this protection that is offered by the omentum may not always be there because the appendix is displaced it is pushed upwards right so infection can spread okay there can be uh, associated sepsis there can be associated peritonitis and again some studies says that there is increased risk of appendiceal rupture in pregnancies some of them says no so it's plus minus but all in all yes pregnancy makes the diagnosis of appendicitis difficult because of the clinical profile and pregnancy uh, is a situation where uh, there can be more risk of peritonitis and uh, sepsis right so keeping that in mind appendicitis needs to be aggressively treated 
so the best option which most uh, of the surgeons prefer to do and i spoke to my surgery colleagues also so the uh, most often what the surgeons uh, prefer to do is an immediate surgery right so immediate laparotomy and again the how you enter the abdomen the root of the surgery whether by a laparotomy or a laparoscopy uh, depends upon the hemodynamic status of the patient surgeon's expertise and the facilities available so the root of entry could be laparotomy or laparoscopy does not matter immediate but in the option it is not given so laparoscopy can also be done and appendectomy removal of the appendix is appendicitis is found that is the most preferred approach okay now there are people who are going to uh, you know uh, uh, admit and observe the patients of of, of, of probable appendicitis also and uh, that is also followed by some but uh, you know again uh, it's a risky proposition there is no clear cut guidelines as to uh, for how long can it be conservatively managed so one has to uh, see the risk versus benefit ratio of you know uh, observing the patient of appendicitis in pregnancy uh, for that there should at least be no appendicial obstruction on uh, initial clinical presentation so less preferable to do but people do so uh, but less preferable so i would say observation is not an answer and uh, antibiotics on observation doesn't make sense surgical makes sense but and, and please remember that you know this has to be done under antibiotic coverage so don't say that you are going to do surgery and you are going to omit antibiotics uh, antibiotics have to be started immediately and then the patient is taken up for surgery okay and regarding cesarean section there is no need to do a cesarean section at the time of appendectomy there is no routine recommendation as such that a cesarean section is required why and particularly our patient was also only 30 weeks so why so there is no routine recommendation of uh, cesarean at the time of appendectomy at all in this question also makes no sense the patient is only 30 weeks so the answer to choose here it option number d okay so you could yes answer this question simply by exclusion also because observation and antibiotics with observation makes no sense cesarean section at the time of appendectomy makes no sense option d is the most likely answer now moving on let's have a look at the next question okay now uh, before i read out the next question to you guys i want to remind you that uh, if you go through the feed of the youtube channel there is a video on acute fatty liver of pregnancy there is a video on obstetric cholestasis separately done there is a small video on jaundice in pregnancy separately done and uh, again uh, i i understand that you know you obviously have, i hope you've gone through those videos separately Separately, but then when you are evaluating the patient, it comes in the form of a differential diagnosis, right? So you need to think about all your possible differential diagnosis at the same time. So, but if you have any, if you want to read up more on jaundice in pregnancy, there's a separate video altogether, a detailed video that I have done. However, I'll go through with this question now. So there is a. Uh, <clears> he <throat> come if she is near term after how long she can deliver normally see uh, you have to take care of her acute appendicitis first many women who've been treated and surgically treated for appendicitis will eventually go into preterm labor also going into preterm labor is a potential complication of the appendicitis and infection and sepsis even after surgical treatment many women go into preterm labor also so that is a complication we have to keep in mind right so we don't basically what we try to do is we don't go for unnecessary obstetric intervention right so that see in obstetrics uh, he come it is very very important when not to do something is equally important to know okay this is a case where obstetrically right now i should be able to give the opinion that i don't want to do anything right so manage your acute appendicitis condition first yes she could go into preterm labor then i will not interfere with the progress of preterm labor also so we'll have to see and manage both the conditions simultaneously that is why most of these medical and surgical uh, you know uh, topics are studied together 
and uh, the, another thing we need to keep in mind is just like we do it in you know routine uh, clinical practice also if i'm managing a patient uh, with appendicitis i have to take in the surgical consult ultimately it becomes a surgical patient isn't it so she could deliver normally she could maybe require cesarean sections for obstetric indications that's the obstetric part of management that remains the same as an obstetrician as a gynecologist you should know that when there is acute appendicitis, first manage the acute appendicitis, okay? Alright, coming back to my question now. 25-year-old primary gravida at 4th month of gestation is seen in the emergency with complaint of excessive nausea, vomiting, there is mild fever and malaise for one week. So, there is a prodromal symptomatology that has been happening for one week. You now notice yellow discoloration of the sclera. So, there is jaundice also. The uterus is 20 weeks in size. She is 4th month pregnant. Uterus for 20 weeks in size fine okay relaxed and fetal heart rate is fine there is tenderness in the right hypochondrium tenderness in the right hypochondrium there is no history of prior right upper quadrant pain her pulse rate bp seems fine her initial lab reports show hb of 8 uh, that's not normal that's anemic tlc raised serum bilirubin quite raised enzymes are markedly elevated serum amylase is normal so what is the most likely diagnosis rajat and asmita have answered rajat is saying it is most likely help syndrome now see um, okay, so let's just, uh, what is the most likely diagnosis? Just, let's just rule out, okay? So we all agree that it is not likely obstetric cholestasis. Obstetric cholestasis predominantly, pre predominantly presents with itching, okay? Jaundice, if at all, happens happens only in about 10% cases. So jaundice is not very common in obstetric cholestasis. And secondly, uh, you know, the enzymes are not so markedly elevated and such bad jaundice isn't there. So this it the, the profile doesn't fit in with obstetric cholestasis. Let's rule that out. Okay. Now the other is help syndrome. Okay, now we are talking about help syndrome. So hemolysis, elevated liver enzymes, and low platelets. So all that information isn't there, Rajat. Where is the information on uh, low platelets? That information is not in the question. It, it, okay, so that information is not there. And even with help syndrome, there isn't such marked jaundice. Such marked jaundice. And with HELP syndrome, there should be some antecedent history of hypertension. If there would have been an antecedent history of hypertension, that would have made the diagnosis of HELP syndrome more likely, right? History like she is having high BP records over the past one week or, you know, history of having diagnosed with preeclampsia somewhere or being followed up for preeclampsia in the OPD. So, that sort of a history should have been there. In the question itself, evidence of hemolysis, evidence of low platelets, that is not given. Okay, so yes, Help syndrome is a potential differential diagnosis, but based on the question that is provided now, based on the information given in the question, help syndrome seems unlikely. So let me rule that out. Then we have acute fatty liver of pregnancy and acute viral hepatitis. So with acute fatty liver of pregnancy, the patient has a very, uh, you know, uh, immediate, uh, once she presents and she is going to be more often in her third trimester. Okay, even with help, it's more likely in the third trimester, in the second half of pregnancy. This patient is in the fourth month of gestation. Another negative, again, again, uh, again, a point I found to rule out help and acute fatty liver of pregnancy. The fact that this thing is happening at fourth month of gestation. So acute fatty liver of pregnancy presents late. Had there been, uh, you know, late presentation, had there been uh, features of uh, encephalopathy, right, uh, had hepatic encephalopathy, had there been features of uh, hypoglycemia, you know, I would have gone more in favor of acute fatty liver of pregnancy, but those causes are not there. Those findings are not given. Secondly, it's a rare thing to happen. 
all in all acute fatty liver of pregnancy is a rare diagnosis living in the tropical countries and in a country where hepatitis is common i would more likely think of this if of this as acute viral hepa hepatitis okay fourth month of gestation viral hepatitis can present at any month of gestation hai na it is incidental so fourth month of gestation fever a prodromal symptomatology that goes in favor of acute viral uh, hepatitis uh, of course there can be hep hepatomegaly because of hepatitis and that can be a cause of tenderness in right uh, hypochond uh, hypochondrium elevated uh, you know this thing um, dlc uh, jaundice which is very severe and enzymes that are markedly elevated they go in favor of acute viral hepatitis and serum amylase is normal that is an extra information so that means it is not pancreatitis also so had there been an option number f another differential diagnosis as pancreatitis this would not not been the answer and why is it not cholelithiasis it's not even option number e it's not simple gallstones just gallstones gallstones will obviously cause a history of right hypochondrium uh, pain a history of bile suggestive of biliary colic that can be there with cholelithiasis but again if it's only cholelithiasis then fever malaise jaundice will not be there until unless it's an obstructive jaundice or a cholangitis so please mind you this is no more this is this is more about the surgical diagnosis of differential diagnosis of acute viral hepatitis versus cholelithiasis which you anyway study in your surgery topics also here i want to highlight on how you are going to differentiate between acute fatty liver of pregnancy obstetric cholestasis help syndrome and acute viral hepatitis these four things okay there is a separate video on this you can go through that also however i'll again again highlight the important points uh, obstetric cholestasis main clinical presentation is pruritus the liver enzymes are elevated but they usually less than 200 jaundice is rare if at all it happens it's less than 5 mg per deciliter and other things are all normal other things are all normal the kidney function test platelet hemolysis is in there coagulation profile everything else is normal hepatitis will have jaundice will have prodromal symptoms of hepatitis right upper quadrant pain enzymes are markedly elevated bilirubin is markedly raised okay and uh, most of the times the cases of hepatitis are also mild so serum creatinine is normal platelets is also mostly normal coagulopathy can happen if there is you know cirrhotic cirrhosis with hepatitis also it's, it's a chronic hepatitis which is acutely flared and worsened then and coagulopathy can also happen with fulminant hepatitis and and one cause of fulminant hepatitis fulminant acute hepatitis in pregnancy is hepatitis e okay so it is hepatitis e which is more dangerous in pregnancy because it can cause fulminant acute hepatitis in which there is more risk of uh, you know coagulopathy also so that is dangerous now in help syndrome the onset is usually late in pregnancy there is going to be some antecedent history given to you in the question like history of hypertension that should be there features suggestive of severe preeclampsia are going to be given to help you come to the diagnosis of help okay and then all three things should be there evidence of hemolysis should be there uh, platelet count should be low low platelets elevated liver enzymes are there but they're not in thousands they're not elevated in thousands around 300 okay or oh, mark jaundice is also not there there's about 1 to 2 uh, mg per deciliter of bilirubin only there okay so this is going to be the symptomatology these are going to be the findings which are going to go in favor of help acute fatty liver of pregnancy like if there are signs and symptoms of uh, liver failure hypoglycemia excess ammonia then they go in favor of acute liver uh, fatty liver of pregnancy in the question and your uh, Uh, liver enzymes are going to be usually less than thousands serum bilirubin is usually less than 10 uh, kidneys uh, are also affected in acute fatty liver of pregnancy serum creatinine is markedly raised platelets are markedly decreased hemolysis is also very marked and the coagulation profile is also markedly deranged so very similar to help you would say this is very similar to help it is very similar to help but yes 
more severe okay signs and symptoms of hepatic failure hypoglycemia excess ammonia they go in favor of acute fatty liver of pregnancy instead of help syndrome so use this chart to uh, you know analyze questions when you have to differentiate between these four options next question now i'm going to continue with hepatitis so the woman is suspected to have acute viral hepatitis so if you've forgotten let's just go back to the profile again fourth month of gestation prodromal symptoms for a week jaundice she is 20 weeks on per abdomen the initial investigations are showing elevated liver enzymes jaundice of 15 gram per deciliter is the bilirubin right liver enzymes are raised tlc is raised and infection is there right so acute viral hepatitis you are suspecting and baseline investigations are sent the initial management of this woman includes all of the following except now this is what i want to drive through when we talk about acute viral hepatitis in pregnancy okay then you manage the hepatitis okay first you have to stabilize the woman's clinical status as far as her hepatitis is concerned it is not an indication for termination of pregnancy immediately that is one thing that you have to remember about hepatitis in pregnancy that is why in a woman who comes with jaundice in pregnancy it's very important that we rule out hepatitis because hepatitis is one condition where we will not immediately terminate the pregnancy okay we don't want however the other differential diagnosis like severe preeclampsia help acute fatty liver of pregnancy these are the situations these are the situations where we will want to terminate the pregnancy immediately that's why it is important to make the distinction that this is hepatitis this is something where immediate delivery is not required right so immediate termination of pregnancy is not done yes you do want to confirm your diagnosis of hepatitis so you are going to go for the various serological tests you that the serological tests that you perform for hepatitis patients like you do in non-pregnant patients also right so you're going to check for anti-hav anti-hbv you know hbs antigen and all those profiles anti-hev so you're going to send the entire profile that you anyways do for your non-pregnant patients with hepatitis as well so you have to come to a diagnosis so you're going to send for those serological tests and conservative management is begun right it is managed in the same way as non-pregnant patients are managed with iv fluids uh, injectable vitamin k if required high carb low protein diet and a baseline ultrasound abdomen will be done Hannah, a baseline ultrasound abdomen of course you're going to focus on the well-being of the fetus also and you will eliminate gallstones as a possibility. You will eliminate the presence of gallstones, cholelithiasis. You will get a basic idea about the liver eco texture and size of the liver. Hepatomegaly can be confirmed after doing initial clinical examination. So that helps in your baseline workup also. So ultrasound abdomen is also required. There is no need for immediate termination of pregnancy that is one driving point here with acute viral hepatitis it's most often conservatively managed and yes of course in women who have uh, acute fulminant hepatitis they will need they may even need intensive care support you know so again the patients will be uh, dealt with according to the clinical severity of the disease now how severe their clinical condition is that will determine how aggressively uh, they are treated okay so this is about acute viral hepatitis in pregnancy let's have a look at the second question uh, sorry let's have a look at the second question on hepatitis now there's a 26 year old woman who's seen at 24 weeks of gestation her hbs antigen is positive there is no history of jaundice in the past there is no history of blood transfusion or iv drug abuse and it's a straightforward question when is the highest risk of transmission of hepatitis b from the mother to the fetus that's the question and please remember this clinical profile because 
if you recall from your medicine study you must be remembering that most of the cases of hepatitis b they are asymptomatic and they are asymptomatic carrier states right many patients will have mild illness right and they will recover so history of jaundice may or may not have been there in the past it can be acquired with blood transfusion iv drug abuse and when you have such history then sexual history should also be undertaken all right and you know uh, partner testing should also be undertaken so that is the hepatitis management part of it but most of the times we identify hbs antigen positivity when we are routinely testing pregnant women aren't we aren't we testing pregnant women routinely it's a routine investigation in pregnancy and that is hbs antigen Uh, status right we routinely do that and this is how we are mostly going to find a woman in the reproductive age group who's positive she may recall having jaund jaundice or some acute illness in the past may not recall that right now the risk is in a pregnancy as obstetrician the risk that i'm bothered about is transmission from mother to fetus so there is absolutely no absolutely no very little absolutely no trans placental transmission okay and hepatitis b is not a teratogenic virus also please remember that right so there is hardly any uh, trans placental transfer and there is hardly any teratogenicity there is is also not associated with abortions or anything okay so what is the risk the risk is that during delivery because the virus is excreted and shed off in uh, in the cervical vaginal secretions and also uh, in the blood right so during the timing of delivery what can happen that the baby can get infected right while a vaginal delivery so it is during delivery that there is risk of transmission of hepatitis b from mother to fetus and then this child who who get who this newborn who gets infected has a very li- very very large likelihood of developing chronic hepatitis early on in life so this condition which is picked up in pregnancy has implications for the future of the child right so that is with this logic try to understand hepatitis b antigen positivity in pregnancy right so highest risk of transmission is during delivery the virus is excreted in breast milk yes but very little amounts of it breast feeding um, uh, you know uh, hardly leads to transmission of hepatitis b from mother to fetus okay so uh, breast feeding is also not contraindicated when the woman is hbs ag antigen positive right so the correct answer is during delivery next question her lfts are normal i want you to remember this profile because when i find a woman who is hbs ag positive this is what i do her lfts are normal her viral markers reveal the following findings okay hbs antigen positive hbe antigen negative igm anti hc uh, anti hbc positive and igg also positive the woman is concerned about transmitting the infection to her baby she is counseled all of the following except she will need elective cesarean section the newborn will be given hepatitis b vaccination and immunoprophylaxis immediately after delivery she can continue to breastfeed the newborn and antiviral treatment can be given to decrease the risk of vertical transmission if her uh, hbv viral load is high which do you think is the incorrect option yes she will be counseled all of the following except what will you not do she is hbs ag positive what will you not do yes so rajat and hikam have quickly answered she will need an elective cesarean section yes that is the false statement so vaginal delivery can be allowed is allowed because to prevent infection okay to prevent infection in the newborn we are instead giving hepatitis b vaccination and immunoprophylaxis immediately after delivery to the newborn so this is what we are doing true to decrease the risk of transmission to the newborn the newborn will get hepatitis b vaccination the course will be started 
preferably this will be done within 12 hours of uh, childbirth and immunoprophylaxis that means hepatitis b immunoglobulin that is given immediately after delivery this is what we are doing to decrease the risk of transmission she will not need an elective cesarean section that is false so this is something that you don't counsel to her i told you she can continue to breastfeed hepatitis b infection is not a contraindication to breastfeeding and then antiviral treatment can be given to decrease the risk of vertical transmission if her viral load is high this is also a true statement this is also a true statement okay so just briefly one thing I want to tell you about uh, hepatitis b hbs ag antigen positivity in pregnancy is that most of the times these pregnant women who have come with this hbs antigen positive report they may be asymptomatic carriers okay or they may have themselves have chronic liver disease uh, with or without cirrhosis right so we don't know now she have we have detected them on routine screening she may be an asymptomatic carrier or she may already be having existent chronic liver disease plus minus cirrhosis so she needs a hepatologist referral okay she does need a physician or a hepatologist referral who is going to assess her disease status right so full workup will be required okay you have all gone through the hepatitis uh, uh, you know we have those serum markers of hepatitis that we have to check right to see if it's uh, chronic hepatitis or not so that we have to see she will be uh, undergoing all the viral markers that are required including the hbv dna levels right hbv dna levels and everything so full workup will be required right now sometimes there are patients with high viral loads so high viral loads are those patients who have more than 10 to the power 6 to 10 to the power 8 copies per ml okay so these are the patients with high viral loads now these are the patients it has been seen that we can give them uh, you know antiviral therapy during pregnancy to decrease their viral load so that the risk of transmission to the newborn is decreased even further even further so apart from immunoprophylaxis we can also do this but only in patients with high viral loads and for that tenofovir can be used during pregnancy okay there's safety records of tenofovir used during pregnancy are there so that is to be done right so option d is also true option a is the false statement here okay so with this we finish off the three topics like i told you if there are any doubts and further queries please put them on the chat box i am looking uh, at it i will wait for a couple of minutes because uh, you while you're still typing any of your doubts and queries right so again let me remind you as far as undergraduates uh, are concerned who are appearing for postgraduate entrance examinations in this topic medical diseases uh, and surgical diseases affecting pregnancy is concerned the examiners want to know and for from an undergraduate student who is learning medicine and surgery also in final year it is expected that when you see a pregnant woman with these possible symptomatology and situations you are at least able to create a differential diagnosis and basic important points of differential diagnosis you should be aware of okay so that is the goal the goal of knowing these conditions is that you can differentiate between these surgical conditions and as far as the obstetric management is concerned again like i told you with most of the times they are going to be managed along the lines they are managed as a non-pregnant patients as well the only things that you need to remember is what is something that you will never do in a pregnant patient like which are the drugs you may never use okay which are the investigations that you don't prefer in pregnancy these are the sort of extra information that you have to remember when you talk about pregnancy uh, along with those diseases okay all right so it was mrcog okay is that it's, it's okay so you are preparing for mrcog part two so that means you're already uh practicing right 
all right so let me see that's 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 um, that is going to be a different course altogether because mrcog is pretty exhaustive okay now rajat uh, you're asking antibiotics choice in uti and bacillary dysentery trimester wise uh, bacillary dysentery trimester wise you'll have to see what if it's you if you if you have amoebic dysentery you will have to treat with metronidazole right and you have to treat with the drugs that uh, that are uh, you use in non pregnant patient also but you just have to remember which drugs you will never ever give you'll have to again risk the way, uh, uh, ratio risk versus benefit in prescribing medications isn't it like for example one drug you should remember rajat here is that uh, uh, your uh, albendazole is uh, contraindicated in the first trimester so if at all you have to give something uh, in lieu of in place of albendazole in first trimester it is going to be mebendazole so that you need to remember right and if you have to treating amoebic dysentery you will have to treat it with metronidazole if you have to treat bacillary dysentery then you will have to uh, see if it's what kind of bacillary dysentery is it there is it e coli related is it is it uh, is it uh, clostridium difficult related so you can give uh, cephalosporins uh, in pregnancy you can give azithromycin in pregnancy right so th these are the these are the ways these questions are to be answered so there's no trimester wise management as such but you need to remember which drugs you're not going to give like doxycycline you're not going to use in pregnancy tetracycline group of medications you're not going to use in pregnancy so again risk versus benefit you'll have to see rajat right and similarly in uti in urinary tract infection in pregnancy again you will have to see uh, see one thing is that you can give empirical treatment in uti in uti in pregnancy you can also start in empirical treatment with nitrofurantoin in india also we are doing that because most of our e coli strains the reports come as susceptible so we can start with empirical treatment with nitrofurantoin send for the culture sensitivity wait for the reports to come back okay sometimes uh, if there is any change in the antibiotics required you can do according to the culture sensitivity reports but remember which are the medications you are going to avoid fluoroquinolones uh, you are going to avoid fluoroquinolones in pregnancy you are going to avoid tetracyclines in pregnancy right so most of the antibiotics in pregnancy can be given with uh, after using the risk versus benefit approach okay uh, rajat did you get my point right okay so you just have to slightly be aware of what you do not give in pregnancy which drug will you not give in pregnancy that is more important to remember okay and izaz uh, thank you so much uh, for your uh, appreciation and uh, i am very glad to listen that you do start reading chapters from your books uh, because i want to drive one important point in my students particularly please uh, friends of course uh, if you are in final year uh, students and if you have the time at your hand uh, do read uh, standard textbooks there is there is no substitute to uh, you know textbook uh, reading that needs to be done okay so um, have a great day uh, okay so uh, have a great uh, saturday evening and sunday and i will see you sometime soon i will work on your suggestions and we can have more such uh, mcq mcq based revisions where we can even you know interact uh, during chat so uh, feel free to give me suggestions you can put them on the chat box or you can also reach out to me on my telegram channel and uh, give me your suggestions there thank you so much guys